Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So today is Pentecost Sunday. So if you came in here with a heavy weight, take it off. Take off everything that is weighing you down, whether it be a bill, a child, grandchild, whatever, fighting in traffic, you're here and you made it. So through that, we're going to go in. I'm going to read Psalms 47. And, and it's, it's amazing to me how this word, it just, just tells you what to do. Clap your hands, all people. Shout to God with a loud song of joy. For the Lord God, the most high, is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. He subdued people under his nation. Uh, he subdued people under and nations under our feet. He chose a heritage for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves, Selah. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with a sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our king, sing praises. For God is the king of the earth, sing praises with a song. God reigns over the nation. God sits on every holy throne. The, prin the princes of the people gather as the people of the, of the God of Abraham. For the shield of the earth belongs to God. He is highly exalted. Hallelujah, Father. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, as we come into your sanctuary on Pentecost Sunday, Lord, expecting great things lord lord expecting lord what you did for them because lord there's nothing new under the sun and you are able to do the exceedingly to all of us father god so we ask lord that we decrease that you may increase in us father god that you may change the chambers of our hearts lord whatever is not in agreement with your word whatever lord has been clogged up, Lord, unclog it, Lord, and set us free. Set us free, Father God, and place us on a firm foundation that we may, Father God, exalt you. In this season where the world is seeming like it's so out of touch with the reality of who you are, Lord, let us come into the realization of who you are and let us seek your face more diligently. In Jesus' holy name, let us praise the Lord. Let us exalt him with exuberance. So let us come boldly to the throne of grace, not sad, but rejoicing in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to read several passages from the book of Isaiah. Key passages that mention the Spirit of God being poured out so that the purposes of the Lord might be fulfilled. Isaiah is divided into three sections. Chapters 1 through 39 have been called 1st Isaiah. It deals with the historical circumstances of the prophet Isaiah and the nations of Israel and Judah. Chapters 40 through 55 are called 2nd Isaiah, and that's a, a long prophecy from Isaiah that speaks of the Lord bringing all the nations of the earth, all the peoples of the earth, all the gods of the nations into his heavenly courtroom and declaring that he alone is Yahweh. He alone is the Lord. He alone is the God of all gods. And then chapters 56 through 66, our third Isaiah, and it's another, again, long prophecy running from 56 through 66 by the prophet Isaiah. And it speaks of how we sustain what God begins in Isaiah 40 through 55, how God's people sustain the return from exile and the glorious promises that the Lord has granted unto us. In each section, there are key verses that have to do with the outpouring of the Spirit. We're going to look at a few of those.
But it's interesting, each one of those sections of Isaiah, there is a key figure who emerges as the center of, of, of all prophecy, as the focus of all prophetic fulfillment, as the means by which God establishes his purposes in Israel and in the earth. The first passage and the first character we will look at is in Isaiah 11. So turn with me to 1st Isaiah chapter 11. This figure is known as the shoot of Jesse, the branch, the scion of David, the Davidic son. It's a picture of the Messiah who will come, the son of David who will come to bring Israel into her purposes. And again, watch as we see this key figure emerge in this prophecy by Isaiah. It's the spirit of the Lord that comes upon this Davidic son and empowers him to fulfill God's purposes. Isaiah 11, 1, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. And this is the picture of the sevenfold spirit of the Lord that will come upon this Davidic son. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, a spirit of wisdom, a spirit of understanding, a spirit of counsel, a spirit of power, a spirit of the knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. The spirit comes upon him so that he delights in the fear of the Lord. When the spirit comes on the church, we delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears. Circumstances will not affect him. But with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. And what is the accomplishment of this righteousness and this justice and the fear of the Lord that the son of David brings? The wolf will lie with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together and lion will eat straw with the ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra. The young child shall put his hand into a viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. When the Spirit comes upon the Son of David, and the Son of David brings the fear of the Lord, it brings reconciliation among those who are hostile toward each other and brings peace and brings rest and brings blessing. The next figure, we go to Isaiah 42, and we've been studying about the servant of the Lord that emerges in 2 Isaiah, in Isaiah 40 through 55. All the things that the Lord is going to do, returning Israel from exile, center in the work of the servant. And we'll look at simply the first servant song. Isaiah 42, verse 1. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom my soul delights. This, of course, was said about Jesus by the Father. I will put my spirit on him. Just as the spirit of God is the motivating factor for the Davidic son in Isaiah 11. The Spirit of the Lord is the motivating factor, the power behind the servant of the Lord. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. There will be no need for human exertion of human power and strength. It's the power of the spirit that will move through him. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not snuff out. 
in, in images of vulnerability. The servant does not come to crush the vulnerable. The servant comes to save the vulnerable. And that's what justice is. That's biblical justice. That's divine justice. That's Isaianic justice. That's gospel justice. In faithfulness, he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on the earth. In his law, the islands will put their hope. The Spirit of the Lord will not allow the servant of the Lord to falter or be discouraged in his task of bringing justice. In the same book, 2 Isaiah, we look at chapter 44, and we make reference to songs that we sang in worship. Isaiah 44 continues, verse 1. But now listen, O Jacob, my servant. The servant of the Lord is, of course, a figure, an anointed figure, a God-called, God-chosen figure, but God's people are also part of that. Their histories are intertwined, the servants and the people of Israel, Jacob. Now listen, O Jacob, my servant. My servant from Isaiah 42 will make you Israel, Jacob, Judah, people of God, church of Jesus Christ, will make you into the servants of the Lord, moving in the same anointing to bring justice. Israel, whom I have chosen, this is what the Lord says, he who made you, who formed you in the womb, and who will help you. Do not be afraid, O Jacob, my servant, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen, my upright one. For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They will spring up like grass in a meadow, like poplar trees by flowing streams. One will say, I belong to the Lord. Another will call himself by the name of Jacob. Still another will write on the palm of his hand, belonging to Yahweh, and will take the name Israel. The Lord will bring all his people together. And just as the Spirit is upon the Davidic son, just as the Spirit is on the servant, so is the Spirit upon us to accomplish the purposes of the Lord. And then in Isaiah 48, the spirit, the, the, the servant of the Lord is going to begin to speak clearly in Isaiah 49 in the second servant song. But in the introduction, we see this in Isaiah 48, 16. Come near me and listen to this. From the first announcement, I have not spoken in secret. At the time it happens, I am there. And now the sovereign Lord has sent me with his spirit. The sovereign Lord is going to send the servant with the spirit of the Lord. And then we move into third Isaiah and we go to Isaiah 61. The key figure in first Isaiah, Isaiah 11, the Davidic son, the key figure in 2nd Isaiah 40 through 55, the servant of the Lord, the key figure in 3rd Isaiah 56 to 66, the Messiah, Isaiah 61, 1, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me, has, a, has anointed me as the Messiah. And this anointing is going to cause me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the captives. He has sent me to release from darkness the prisoners. He has sent me to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He has sent me to proclaim the day of vengeance of our God. It's a day of courtroom vindication for the Lord. He's the one that needs to be vindicated. It's his name that has been blasphemed among the nations. 
It's his name that has been slandered. It's his name that has been spoken lies against. When we're so driven for ourselves to be vindicated, we miss the purpose of the work of the Messiah, of the anointing, of the Spirit of the Lord coming upon us. The vindication is that our Lord will be vindicated. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit being vindicated. He has sent me to comfort all who mourn. He has sent me to provide for those who grieve in Zion. He has sent me to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is poured out on the Davidic son, on the servant of the Lord, on the Messiah, on the church at Pentecost and on the church today. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is poured out that the spirit of the Lord may replace the spirit of despair that grips us. Yes. And then when the spirit is poured out on the Messiah, they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord for a display of his splendor. There are two words, key words used in, in, in this section of Isaiah prophetically that describes the glory of the Lord. One is the weight, the weight of his presence, the kavod, the glory. But this word is the beauty realm. It's the glory. There's a dimension of God's beauty that is manifested when his glory is poured out. Spirit of the sovereign Lord, be poured out on your church. Remove despair from us, O oh God, and reveal not only the weight of your glorious presence, but bring us into the beauty realm, Lord, that we may be healed, Lord that we may be healed and you give us a crown of beauty instead of ashes, oil of gladness to replace our mourning, garment of praise to replace our spirit of despair, that we might be called the oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, the display of his splendor. When the spirit is poured out on the church, we will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. Lord, when we look around at the Father's house, Lord, the Father's house is desolate, Lord. We are lamenting in the Father's house. The Father's house is in ruins, Lord. Come, O oh God, and make us into sons and builders, Lord God sons and builders to rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. Yes. When the Spirit comes on the church, they will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. And as scripture continues in verse 7, instead of their shame, my people will receive a double portion. Instead of disgrace, they will rejoice in their inheritance. And so they will inherit a double portion of their land. Firstborns, all of us, and everlasting joy will be yeah. theirs, oh God. Lord, when the spirit of the sovereign Lord comes upon the Mashiach, the anointed one, Lord God, then, Father, you restore our inheritance. It's the year of Jubilee, Lord. You bring us back to our inheritance, Father. You cancel our debt. You terminate slavery among your people. And then the final verse from Isaiah, we'll just step back to Isaiah 59. 59, 19, 20, and 21. From the West, men will fear the name of the Lord. And from the rising of the sun, they will revere his glory. For he will come like a pent-up flood that the breath of the Lord drives along. And 
even though most of your translations say the breath of the Lord, remember the Hebrew word ruach can be translated wind, it can be translated breath, it can be translated spirit. So we, we reread this, for he will come like a pent up flood that the spirit of the Lord drives along. Yeah. The spirit comes and brings anointing. The spirit comes and brings healing. The spirit comes and brings rest and restoration. But the spirit also comes and drives us forward inevitably to fulfill what God raised us up for. Beyond that, what God created us for. We have been created for this hour, church. Spirit of the Lord, be poured out upon us. Drive us along like a pent-up flood that the Spirit of the Lord causes. The Redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who repent of their sins, declares the Lord. And that's what we're going to do when we partake of the Lord's Supper momentarily. We are going to repent of our sins. The Spirit is being poured out. We're going to repent of our sins in the presence of our Redeemer, our kinsman Redeemer, the one who buys us back from debt slavery, and he returns to Zion. So we say, Spirit of the Lord, relocate our lives in Zion. Yes. May, we, may we be relocated Christologically in Christ in Zion because the Redeemer's coming to Zion, not to us. We go to Zion and he comes to us by our faith and our hope and our love in Christ Jesus. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. This is the covenant that the Spirit of God will drive us into. This is the covenant that the Spirit of the Lord will bring us, in which the Spirit of the Lord will bring us to Zion and where we will meet the Redeemer. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My Spirit who is on you and my words that I have put in your mouth will not depart from your mouth or from the mouths of your children or from the mouths of their descendants from this time on and forever, says the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord says there is a continuity among the generations. And I know we tend to think, we think forward. And when we see things like these things will not depart from our mouth or the mouths of our children or for the mouths of our children's children, we think of our children. But remember, we are children. And for those of us, and that's many of us, most of us, whose parents have gone before us, think in those terms, the Spirit of the Lord and the Word of the Lord that the Lord put in their mouths have now come down to us. And it's both forward and backward. It's a generational unity accomplished by the Spirit of the Lord. When the Spirit is poured out, He breaks down all. He breaks down all division between generations. He breaks down all divisions between ethnic groups. He breaks down all divisions in terms of gender. He breaks down all divisions in terms of our Christian tradition. He breaks them down and the Spirit of the Lord causes the wolf to lie with the lamb, the lion and the ox, and a little child's pet is a cobra. That's what takes place when the Spirit of the Lord moves in our midst. So, Lord, we come before your throne in the name of Jesus. We repent in Zion this morning, and we repent in Zion because you poured out your Spirit upon us today, and we ask that you continue to pour out your Spirit upon us. And as we have been fond of saying recently, Lord, and you pour out your Spirit, and you don't simply visit us, Lord. You remain in our midst. You dwell in our midst, O oh God. And you sustain the work that you desire to do in your church, Lord. Father, we think this day, Lord God, of the nations of the earth, Lord. 
the nations of the earth were in the picture there in Pentecost. When you poured your spirit out, it was upon all flesh. And so, Lord, we as we repent, Lord, and as we say, pour out your spirit in our midst, O God. Pour out your spirit on our brothers and sisters, Lord, in Israel. Pour out your spirit on our brothers and sisters in Palestine. Pour out your spirit on our brothers and sisters in Iran. Pour out your spirit on our brothers and sisters in China. Pour out your spirit on our brothers and sisters in Pakistan, Lord. Pour out your spirit on our brothers and sisters in the Congo, Lord. Pour out your spirit on our brothers and sisters in Egypt, Lord. Pour out your spirit on our brothers and sisters in Colombia, Lord God. Pour out your spirit on our brothers and sisters in Cuba, Lord. Pour out your spirit on our brothers and sisters, Lord God. Wherever the name of the Lord is called, Father. Pour out your spirit on our brothers and sisters, Lord God, who are indigenous peoples, Lord, the first peoples of this land. Pour out your spirit on our brothers and sisters who were forcibly brought here, Lord God, from their native lands in Africa, Lord God. Pour out your spirit on our brothers and sisters in the cities and in the suburbs, Lord. Pour out your spirit on our brothers and sisters, O God. Pour out your spirit on our brothers and sisters across this nation, our brothers and sisters in Canada, our brothers and sisters in Mexico, Lord. Just as you did on Pentecost, you pour out your spirit on all the church, Father. Do it in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we stand before you in repentance and forgiveness, Lord. The Redeemer has come to Zion that the Spirit of God might continue to be poured out upon us, Lord. And we might become your dwelling place in Zion as we rebuild the ancient ruins and the desolate places. In Jesus' name we pray it. Zion of David, servant of the Lord, anointed Messiah, Continue to do your work in our midst. Father, may you be pleased with his work in us. Spirit of God, complete the purposes of the Lord for human history in us. In Jesus' name, amen. This will be our format for the remainder of the service. We've invited the leadership team, intercessors, to come. We've been, we pray together as a leadership team every Friday night. We pray, we speak, we share what the Lord has given to us for this congregation. The intercessors come together weekly and pray in the same manner. And we're gonna invite leadership to come forth they may share a word and then pray. They may just come up and pray, but we're going to just, we're trying to reduplicate what happens to us on Friday nights when the Spirit moves powerfully and mightily in our midst when we come together as leaders or Friday afternoon when the intercessors come together. So with that in mind, we're just going to invite the leadership team and the Intercessors come forth one by one. Share, pray, or do both. But definitely pray. Amen. Well, I'll go first. I was kind of hoping to go last because then I could see what everyone else was sharing. I just, uh, I'm, I'm just going to tell you what has been going on with me. Um, looking at Psalm 62. I'm going to read Psalm 62, and then I'm going to explain. Psalm 62. Truly my soul silently waits for God. From him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. 
How long will you attack a man? You shall be slain, all of you, like a leaning wall and a tottering fence. They only consult to cast him down from his high position. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly, Selah. My soul wait silently for God alone, for my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and the refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us, Selah. Surely men of low degree are a vapor. Men of high degree are a lie. If they are weighed on the scales, they are altogether lighter than vapor. Do not trust in oppression, nor vainly hope in robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on those riches. God has spoken once, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. Also to you, O Lord, belongs mercy. For you tender, for you render to each according to his work. I really want to focus on um, verse 6. He is my rock and my salvation. No, I'm sorry, verse 7. He is my, if in God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. You know, every one of us in here will say we are saved. We run into a lot of people that are saved, but yet their lives don't reflect salvation. And sometimes and many times, I feel like my life does not reflect salvation. And if I don't hold on to that salvation in God, there will not be glory in God. So many of us have wandered away, not on purpose. We were drawn by the world. The world likes to lure us. And I really have been seeking God, first for myself, that I get back and expecting God to be my salvation, to looking to God as my Savior. And when I do that, when God becomes everything to me, he saves me from everything, then I will enter into his glory. But it can't be both ways. That's what I see. And that's where God has been dealing with me. When I have extra time, I can hear his voice speaking to me. You know, pray to me, Jan. Talk to me, Jan. When, and I just feel like the world, you know, think about it. When they get an extra few dollars, what do they do with them? They spend them on something they may want rather than something that maybe people need. We have lost our salvation. Not that you aren't really saved. I don't believe God, but I have met so many people. I don't believe they're saved, but I'm not God. I don't make that determination. God said you'll know them by their fruit. You'll know them how they act, right? And so I want to be a godly woman. I want, it, um, I want people to see God in me. Not because I want to be something, but because I want to draw all men unto God, unto Jesus. So I'm going to pray into that, and I don't know if that makes sense. I hope it makes sense, because this has been my drive. This has been where I'm at lately, to turn my life around. Now, I know I'm at the end of my life, not at the beginning or the middle. And I know when you're in the middle... You have you feel secure that you have a lot of time, but when you're me and some of my friends, we're we know we know we don't have a lot of time. So I want to get things straight this side of heaven. I, I and it, that's not my motivation either. I really do want to get closer to God. I, I I want there to be changes in my life, and I I just pray that. Um, Pastor and I can be uh, a reflection of Jesus to all that know us. So, dear Lord, I'm just praying. I'm praying for this church 
I'm praying for myself that I will seek you with all my heart, that I will look again for salvation in you, not in other things, not in other people, that I will always be on that path looking straight ahead at you. I know, Lord, when I am with you and you are with me, your glory will fall. I can feel the Holy Spirit. I felt the Holy Spirit today in worship. I know that is all. It's possible for all of us. I just pray, dear God, that something new and fresh is happening, taking us back to our beginning and walking us through again. Everyone in this room has bowed the knees to you. I pray, dear God, now you open our eyes that we may see the path you have prepared for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Forgive me first for being emotional. I've been very emotional these days. Can't help it. God's presence, God's requirements. And that's kind of what I want to share today. You know, we've been prayerful, but have we really went deep enough? Have we said the words? But have we really done what he's asked us to do? That's what the Lord's asking me. And, uh, you know, we've studied and studied Psalms and Isaiah, and I've been reading through the Old Testament, and the constant back and forth, back and forth, sin and exile, mercy and restoration. And it's like, Lord, that's us. When do we get to that place that we are restored to him? And I really felt like the Lord saying, the price is great. And are we willing to pay the price? Now, Pastor has taught, I mean, the amount of time he studies to bring forth what he's been teaching and preaching to us is just immeasurable, and it's been life-changing, really. It's been revelatory for me, and I know for many of you. And then I've been reading Todd Smith's book, Pastor Smith, with the uh, North Georgia Revival, and I'm not a theologian. I receive everything he shares, uh, Pastor Oz, but I don't speak like him. But I'm reading Todd Smith's book, and he speaks like me. So it's been really um, humbling. Those of you that are going to get the book, read it. It's, it's going to enrich what he has been teaching us to bring it to a basic level. And again, the requirement... Are we willing to pay the price? Am I willing to pay the price? Pastor Smith shares a few things. I'm going to just share three that I was studying and, and reading and praying this morning, knowing that um, I would have some time this morning. Uh, if you want to turn to Second Chronicles 7, verse 1 through 3. It reads, when Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple, and the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. When all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. <sighs> Pastor Smith outlines three progressive stance that leads to this. The first is prayer, which we have committed ourselves to. 
privately, corporately, the need and the desperate need to pray and to cry out to the Lord. Lord, take out our ears, help us. It's not about my needs. We all have needs. We all have uh, serious needs that we pray for for our own selves and our families. But I'm talking about a, a cry to the heart of the Father that he is requiring. And for us, we're prayerful. So it's a discipline I believe most of us have acquired. The second that he points to is an altar, creating a place for sacrifice. That can come about in our lives. What we are willing to set aside to create a place to make an offering to the Lord. Now that can mean many things to many people. It can mean money, it can mean you know um, service, helps, whatever. But there has to be an altar created. And he, he, it has to be prepared properly. When the Lord, and I'm reading through the Old Testament, everywhere there's an altar built, it's very specific in how it's built what it's built from and the very place that it needs to be built because it has significance. And it has significance for future generations. But the last one is the most difficult. And I don't know how many of us are prepared. I know I'm not. I want to be, but I'm not. I want to get there. It's a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice. God's fire, he says, does not fall on an empty altar. No sacrifice, no fire, no glory. And we sang a lot about glory this morning. And, you know, I mean, I'm studying and reading and searching about the term of God's glory. But, I mean, even the priests, the very ones that knew how to be in God's presence, couldn't be in his presence when the glory fell. That freaks me out. That when his glory comes, who is able are we going to be able? Pastor talks about the weight of his presence. The weight of his presence is enough to kill a person, and that's what he's after. He's after a sacrifice of us. A once and done, final, laying down everything and let the fire of God go deeply in us. And believe me, I'm not there. I desire to be there. I believe, Pastor mentioned it today, just the flood moving us forward. I really believe that there's, there's, we're being projected forward to this. But saints, we need to be prepared to lay everything down. I'm not there. I'm being honest with you. I'm not there. I, I want to be there. I believe he's driving me there as well as so many of you. Our church, I'm not worried about numbers at all. I, I don't care. But what I care about is standing alongside of all those that have laid everything down and want God's glory to the point where we will be able to stand in his glory. I mean, the priests couldn't do it. The people of Israel couldn't do it. They couldn't stand in the midst. That, that scares me a little bit. And I, I've told Pastor this. I have really played church, and I've played it well, from worship to Sunday school to all the years going back that I have played church, and I've done it well. And I feel like the Lord has said, that's over. It's done with. It's not acceptable any longer.
You know, there's something unique about sacrifice. You want to be a sacrifice? Death draws God's attention. Tommy, uh, Pastor Smith said, Todd Smith, that, you know, death draws his attention. The more death God smells, the closer he comes. Think about it. Why did he orchestrate sac animal sacrifice and an offering? Scripture says it becomes a sweet aroma. I don't know about you, but a burning animal to me is not very sweet. But to the Lord, there's a burning in the issue of sacrifice that draws him to us. That's in Leviticus 1.17. Burning flesh is a sweet aroma to the Lord. Burning flesh attracts God's attention. So I'm just being totally honest with everybody, and I'm going to pray now. Um, I'm not there. I'm a little afraid. God's made me a man to be able you know, like most men, we're, we're able, been able all my life. A little too much at times, and God said, you know, back off. Been in his way a lot. But I really, to be unable to lay everything down and lay on that altar and allow his fire to come down and consume every part of me, I desire it but I'm scared, you know, to let it all go. So just pray with me now. Lord, this is a very unique place. It's like being between two worlds. I can't survive in the one and I don't want to die in the other. It's, it's just a difficult place. So I'm asking that you help me. Help my brothers and sisters. We're at an hour, Lord, where the cost is being required. Give us a willingness, Lord, like we've never had. Lord, never allow us to play church again but to be as you've called us to be, disciples, discipling others, an army, warriors, that, Lord, we will step away from those things that have tied us down, consumed our time, social media, all manner of foolishness, Lord, that has captivated so much of our time, I pray, Lord, Lord, help me. Help me to utter those words as I hear you say, who will I send? I want to say, send me. Just help me, Lord. As I lay down everything at your feet today, Lord, Begin to work in me, Lord, those things, and work out of me those things that need to go to make me a willing vessel, Father. I pray this in the precious, precious name. Lord Jesus, you are everything. Amen. I really wasn't going to um, share unless the Lord gave me something. I really didn't have anything. Um, Last night, right before I went to bed, <clears throat> excuse me, the Lord reminded me about Esther, and um, you know we all know the story, so I don't want to spend you know time going over the story, but um, you know she's taken basically just a commoner and and goes through all these changes and all these sacrifices, 
and goes through, you know, according to scripture, a year of preparation. I mean, she gave up a lot. She changed a lot, right? And we're talking about that. Um, a huge transformation she went through. And we come to the point where, you know, her, um, the man who raised her, her father type, um, finds out there's a plot to kill all the Jews. And she doesn't want to do anything about it. And, you know, we always quote the famous quote, um, and let me just, I want to read it. Um, yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such, such a time as this. And you know what? I love Esther. It's one of my favorite books. And this quote has championed me so many times. And, you know, Lord of the Harvest has a call on it like this. I know it does. And, you know, hasn't her heart always burned with this um, sense of knowing there's great things God has called us to yes. as a body. And I mean, I know it, that I know it, that I know it. I mean, some of what we're expecting God to do and move and abide with us has, is nothing new. It's been in our hearts all along. And this church is called to greatness. And we have been called for such a time as this. But you know what we forget, and it never dawned on me until last night the Lord showed me? It came with another rebuke before she's championed like this. And we forget that she was changed and she sacrificed and she gave so much. And yet here she is going, that's enough. We've had enough in her palace, the queen. She's got things to do. Can you imagine she's the queen? She's got stuff to do. I guarantee you she's got stuff to do. And listen to what Mordecai says to her. Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. So number one, if you really want to do this, if you really want to accomplish all that God has put in your heart, as part of this body, you're not going to escape just because you're in this house. And this is the part that should really get us, guys. If you remain completely, completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the people that we're called to minister to from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. That puts the fear of God in me, because you know what? He don't need us, guys. If she was not willing to continue to change and sacrifice, even in her palace, even with that crown on her head, God was going to raise up somebody else. And you know, pastor said, you know, what happens at prayer? This is what happens, should be happening when we pray. We should be seeing the desolation of our hearts. We should have the fear of the Lord. We should be getting revelations that never dawned on us before. We should realize that we're not measuring up. And one of the other things that it says in that book, I like devoured like three quarters of that book on Friday. I actually had a day that I could absorb some things and didn't have queen stuff to do. Um, one of the things it says in that book is, if it's Sodom and Gomorrah out there, this is why. Amen. So what, what are we lacking in the church? And I'm not talking about Lord of the Harvest and our pastors. I'm talking about the church as a whole. Right. Where's our power? Where's our effectiveness? Amen. I'm not walking on scorpions and not getting bit. I'm not laying hands on the sick and getting healed, seeing people healed. Um, I think that's all. I just want to pray. Yeah. Lord, you, you have called your people, not just us, Lord, all of your people, to great and mighty things, Lord. And there is a season, there is a time, Lord, that we are coming upon that will be nothing, like nothing we've ever seen before, Lord. We know it, Lord. It burns in our hearts, and it has for so many years. Lord, have mercy on us and forgive us, Lord God, that we think we have 
reached queenly status and don't need to sacrifice anything else. Forgive us, Lord, that we, that we've arrived. Forgive us, Lord, that we forget that you can raise up other people yes. if we choose to not obey and sacrifice what you're asking us to. Yes. Have mercy on us, God. Lord, and in that mercy, Lord, and in that repentance, Lord God, champion us, Lord God, to do all that you have called us to do, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Well, Teresa, um, we're not identical twins, but we are twins in spirit, that's for sure. I was sitting with Philip and open to the book of Esther when you were sharing, so I thought this would be a good... um, place to uh, jump in. Um, I just got done doing months and months of a study of Esther, and it, like Teresa, it has really, really um, impacted my life. And overall, in the whole book, it doesn't mention God at all, but his fingerprints and presences on the whole book. And um, as we were uh, studying, you know, we looked about, uh, looked at praying and fasting, that it was, you know, something that was done in that day. And then, you know, Esther had others praying and fasting, even non-believers with her, to see the, the, uh, the will of God being accomplished and the enemy, Haman, being defeated. And, um, it's interesting to note that what was put in motion by a f- foolishness of the king at the time could not be revoked because it was stamped with his authority. And so, you know, we're, we oftentimes come to a place where we're perplexed at how things are developing in our walk with the Lord, how we thought it would be versus how it actually is. Do you know what I'm saying? And so, anyways, um, as as the edict went forth and Haman made his plans, you know, we know the end, the villain is destroyed. But really the purpose for, for Esther was not just for herself and her the favor that was upon her, it was for others. And that is the purpose of the church. It is not just that we would succeed, that we would defeat the enemy, but it is for others. And so what happened is, you know, she still was very upset when the edict of the destruction of her people was still in plan and it couldn't be revoked. And so what happened is the king did another revision and God does a revision in our lives sometimes and it doesn't look like the original of what we thought but um, he revised it so that they could fight for themselves the Jewish people could fight for themselves they could take up arms and they they actually um, did do that and so my my point is um, really going through the story I, I think it's really um smart to read this. There's so many lessons to be learned. But um, in the very end of the story, what happened when um, the Jews were successful in fighting, which I think we need our war cry back, right? Uh, not just to stand in the Lord's favor, but that it, our, that favor is for and equipping for the future and for others. And so anyways, when, when all was said and done, um, in chapter 8, verse 17, um, there was the Feast of Purim for the first time, and that was a celebration and joy of, of defeating the enemy. And it was a, it's a, still a holiday to this day. And even in the holiday to this day, when they repeat the story among themselves, the Jewish people, when they say, uh, Haman, they boo out loud. And so it's, it's, it's an ongoing story. But really, here's, here's the crux of the whole thing that I'm getting at in verse 17. And in every province and city, wherever the king's command and decree came, that's that second decree, the change, 
the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a holiday. So the church, the Jews were celebrating and having a feast. But here's the thing. Then many of the people of the land became Jews because fear of the Jews fell upon them. And this is really the plan of God, I believe, all along, not just for the Jewish people, but for the Gentiles as well. And the fact that um, God showed his favor to the Jewish people and that it overflowed upon the people of the land, the unbelievers, the Gentiles, that they came to faith. And that is really, regardless of how circumstances look out, that's the, 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 um, the destiny that we are headed for as a church is that others would come to the Lord and come to faith. And because of the fear of the Lord, um, the Jews came to, uh, to that because of the fear of the Lord, but the unbelievers came because of the fear of the Jews. And so f for us as a people, we need to impact the loss in a way that they fear us as a model for standing in the holiness of God. And um, so that's really all I have to say, but I do want to pray. Um, and let me also be really honest here. This is a side note. I have been personally in such a place of crushing absolute grief and sorrow over what's been going on with my grandkids and what they face and what their parents face. That, um, I receive solace and comfort the very, very most when I am with the saints. When we are praying together, I receive strength. I receive supply. And so for all of you that are out there and are feeling uh, alone maybe in your faith and maybe feeling that you can't do this, I want to just say, Connect, connect in the spirit, connect to the body of Christ, get on the phone, get on FaceTime, pray with people, have communion over uh, the internet, whatever you may do. It may be different than what it's been, but I will say that the body of Christ in this hour has become so, so important to me, vital, vital in not only surviving, but overcoming and reaching that final destination about others and not just myself. So Lord Jesus, forgive me for all the closed off hidden places that I just can't go because of the pain. And make this crushing be valuable in your sight to bring about, Lord, new life and new wine for this wineskin for Lord of the Harvest and beyond, Father God. Lord, like Teresa, we want to influence as many people as we can for Jesus Christ and for the kingdom of God. And not just merely in signs and wonders, but in discipleship and in the preparation for the days ahead. Amen. I have a lot in my heart, as well as I think all of us. And um, it's just probably best to just kind of let it rip, I guess. Lord of the Harvest has learned over the years right prophetic, right discernment, right justice, right discipleship, right character. So many things we've learned and there are still so many more that we have to 
and just two that I think are really coming up. I've been, since Pete Beck came, he spoke to us last about hope. And honestly, I believe hope is something that we need to have a right hope in this hour. There's obviously the church at large has to have a new understanding of a right unity. But we, you know, that's one that is going to take a lot of time. I mean, we're at a place in the American church where we're arguing over our selfish, whether our selfish ways about stupid things like this. And that's, I hate to say it, this is a bad place for the church to be. And I, I bring up the word hope, and I want to say, like, you know, there are things, Pastor Janine alluded to it, Teresa standing here is a visual of it. There are heavy, 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 heartbreaking things going on in our church. It's not, I stubbed my toe, can you pray for me? There are like one in 10 billion diseases, you know, that are, that bodies, members of our body are afflicted with. There's cancer that our body is afflicted with. There is struggle where there's been victory. There's been, there's been struggle. And, and it seems like we can't, like we're praying and we're praying and we're, laying our hearts down to the Lord and we're just crying out to him, Lord, move, Lord, move, Lord, move. And it sometimes feels like nothing is happening. And I guess this is why when I keep here, I keep hearing Pete Beck's words about hope coming to us. And, and um, there's more to it, but I mean, you know, I think it's this one. Yeah. Romans 15, 4, I just want to throw this one out there. Everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. So there's, there's, there's kind of a precursor word, endurance, yeah. there. Yeah. We're, I guess maybe we're learning right endurance in this hour. And, you know, Lord, teach us to have right endurance. One thing we're also learning is we're, we're learning suffering. Yeah. And I, you know, I haven't read the book yet. Um, and I will as soon as it's available for, for, for us. But um, I think he talks about suffering, if I remember correctly. I know he, he talked about it in the message so we are, as a church, having to learn about right suffering. And, you know, like I said, we're at the American church. We're, we're fighting over suffering about having to wear a mask or suffering to actually have to think of somebody before ourselves. And that's really a hard place to be. And, and I alluded to this during worship and, and, and I agree with Pastor Philip. I'm not there. I don't know that any of us are, but I can tell you we can have hope because I found somebody in scripture who was human and not just, you know, fully God and fully man, you know, for those who would say, well, Jesus could do it because he was fully God. So I found an actual human. Paul was warned several times not to go not to go back to um, to Jerusalem, excuse me. I'm, my it's a downfall of having technology sometimes, and so he's he's warned. But in Acts twenty one, twelve and thirteen, they're talking to him. This is like the last warning, and here's the subtitle above it: "We all warn Paul." but he is immovable. 
Lord, make us immovable in this hour. See, so when we heard him say this, we and the people begged Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered us, what do you mean by unnerving me with all your tears? I am perfectly prepared not only to be bound, but to die in Jerusalem for the sake of the name of the Lord Jesus. Here's, their, here's, their, here's how they reacted. Since he could not be dissuaded, all we could do is say, may the Lord's will be done and hold our tongues. I'm blown away by this, that Paul can have that kind of resolve. And so I, I keep, you know, I keep, I'll go back to the things that I said, we've got so many heavy things to pray for. And it's like, Lord, are we asking amiss? And maybe in some ways we are. Because my heart, because I love this cute little blonde haired, blue eyed boy with this adorable smile named Jackie. I wanna see him well because I love him. Or Teresa's one of my wife's closest friends and she's one of our closest friends, Joe, Joe and Teresa, you know, their family. You know, we love them and we wanna see her well or whatever the situation, you know, I mean, we want, so maybe we are, maybe I'm asking a miss or, or what, do we have the resolve that Paul had, you know, for the sake of the name of the Lord Jesus? Do we have the resolve to say, Lord, if this suffering has to happen, let it happen for the sake of the name of the Lord Jesus. But Lord, on the other hand, I still pray for the miraculous for the sake of the name of the Lord Jesus, rather than my own selfish desire to see the healing. I want to see your name put forth. And that's where I think we're going back to, all tying back to Pete Beck and right hope. Lord, we have to endure you know, these things. Give us a right hope so that we see things for the sake of the name of the Lord Jesus. Yes. Father God, we're not there. As we've, we've all come to those conclusions, Lord, and, and we're only going to see a part of you. And even as we grow, we're one church, only going to see a part of you. But Lord, we want more of you. We at this body don't, we've alluded to it all day. We've talked about it for weeks in leadership and in, in, in conversation with each other. We don't just want you to come visit and have a nice worship service where we can throw up our hands and feel good for a few minutes. Lord, we want you to dwell here. We want you to dwell here. And Lord, we want whatever goes on to forward the name of the Lord Jesus. We want whatever suffering we're having to go through to push forward the name of the Lord Jesus and to bring glory to the name of the Lord Jesus. And Lord, yes, we will continue to cry out for the miraculous in every situation. But even that, Lord, show us how to do it right so that we forward the name of the Lord Jesus and not do it in our selfish desires. Lord, whatever you want to do right now, Lord, make us a people ready to hear it, see it, walk in it, and be a part of it for the glory of the Lord Jesus and for the forwarding of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus in this hour. Amen. Um, I just want to say that I agree. I'm not there. And I have to be honest, I don't want to be there. And I want, and I don't know how, how all of you are feeling, but um, I'm getting to the place where I want the Lord to change my heart about being there. And I felt for a long time, like like Pastor Philip did, that um, you know, church became a routine. Following the Lord was a routine, you know. Um, praying, it just seemed like it was it was a routine, and. Um, so I really inquired of the Lord and I was like, okay, something has to change here. If we want if we want the Lord to move in our midst, like we're talking about, if we want him to be 
the depths of our heart. Something has to change. And I heard two words in my spirit, and it was, be intentional. So, you know, I, I'm not real, um, like, uh, Bible savvy or whatever, but I started to really think about what that meant. And um, in crying, you know, what am I supposed to do, Lord? I just kept hearing, be intentional. And then I was reading in the scripture and it said, the Lord knows the thoughts and intents of your heart. And I was like, oh no, <laughs> I am in such trouble. And um, the more I read, and I started reading the Gospels again, and um, I realized Jesus did everything with intention. Everything he did. Everything he said. Everywhere he went. Everyone he touched. There was a purpose and an intention. So I was like, okay, I need to get that thought in my head, that even in the mundane things of the day, you know, just running to the store even, I have to be intentional. And I began to ask the Lord, is, is there a purpose in this? If you have a purpose in this, then let me know. If you have something you want me to say, then give me the words to say. And he began to do that. And I began to realize that, you know, you see that, you know, that little bracelet, what would Jesus do, you know? It's so real. Like everything he did, you know? Um, even becoming a, a, a baby, being vulnerable, even when he was in the temple at 12 years old, there was a purpose to it. He had intention, you know? Um, having to go through Samaria, there was a woman at the well, you know? being in the crowd, and then intentionally pointing out that somebody touched him and was healed. Um, you know, intentionally not going to see Lazarus until he died, you know, and then raising him from the dead. Everything. And then I read the scripture that said that he had steadfastly set his face toward Jerusalem um, to, take, to go to the cross. And um, I'm not steadfast in that, but I want to go if that means that he will be glorified, yeah. that he will be shown in our midst, that he will be, he will be displayed to the neighborhood, to those that need yeah. Yeah. a touch from God, who need to be healed and delivered and, you know, um, so I, I just, I don't know where your hearts are at, but I'm just being honest where my heart's at. So I just want to pray, Lord. Lord, we say over and over, and I've said over and over, more of you, Jesus, and less of me. And that, and that includes going to the cross. And you went for the joy set before you, Lord God. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would cause the intentions of my heart and the intentions of our hearts to be that what, that would bring you glory and honor, that your glory would be displayed in, in our midst, Lord God, that you would come and stay. Yes, you would just not visit us when our hearts were um, there, but even when our hearts aren't, Lord God, you would come and stay and change our hearts. Lord, we thank you that you are a God of redemption and restoration. And we ask, Lord God, that that would be uh, in our midst, Lord God, that we would move forward where you have called us to be, Lord. Because like, like it's been said, you have called us to something greater than this. You have called us. And I say, Lord God, that one step at a time, we'll go forward. We'll walk to the cross. And maybe it's not willingly, Lord God, but in obedience, we go. And we say, have your will, have your way with us. 
for the sake of your kingdom and that you may receive glory and honor through your son Jesus and by your Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen. In our multicultural church, I just feel like everybody that's gotten up here before me, if, um, if you guys are struggling so hard with being saved and the presence of God to dwell within you, then I'm just a heathen. And because in this multicultural church, when I came in here, the thing, and I know I've said this to you guys all the time, is I experienced is love, but not your love. So I need to make that clear. It wasn't your love that I experienced. It was the love of the Father through you guys that drew me. So let the love of the Father, y'all know, because I, I keep, as I've been praying and praying, I keep seeing crowds and crowds and, and not understanding these crowds until you guys came up here. When we're praying together on Wednesday, Tuesday, whenever the days may be, we bring crowds. It's not just us, you know, our house. We bring crowds. So in, in bringing those crowds, we, we're not just selfish. We're not into ourselves. We're not where we're so, so consumed with, I gotta pay the light bill. I, this child right here, I'm gonna smack him. We're not consumed with that. You know, um, we're not selfish. And God has been so good because there has been miracles. There has been um, where God has opened up doors and, and done different things. There has been suffering. Suffering is something we're gonna have until we take that last breath. So me personally, I, I'm with Louise. I'm kind of with Louise. I, I'm never going to be there because I'm so out there sometimes and I'm like, you made me like this. So, but I love God so much and I want the things of God. But when people see me and what they like about me, it's not me. It's the God I love. It, it's nothing. I, when a Muslim lady screamed my name, she tripped me out because I'm like, I know she know I love God, and I know they hear me praying sometimes. So when she said, Joyce, pray, and in front of people like she did, it was, she wasn't calling me. She was calling for my God. She wasn't calling for me. So when people see us out and about, and even in this neighborhood, some people in the line, they, they say that they might not want prayer. My whole thing is, really? How can you tell me you don't want prayer? You woke up this morning. Really? Is your bill paid? You got a car. You don't want prayer. And so when I begin to point out some things to them, because in the crowds, because I just see all these crowds, that's all I see is crowds, and they're coming. And, and so for us to be in a place of humility, and I, and I believe that's what we're doing right now, a place of humility, a place of, um, Lord, it's not me. It would never be us. It would always be him. I go to funerals and I put my hand on them all the time. Get up. I do because I don't know when God's going to use me to perform, but I believe it. I believe it. I don't believe that God said I can do this and I don't. I, be I don't know when it's going to happen. You know, I go to hospitals. I pray for people. Well, not like I used to because of COVID. But, you know, you go to people. You People love the God in you. Pastor Philip has a, I don't know, he has a big auditorium of people that he brings. And Pastor Oz, they bring so many people in prayer and I'm like and so I don't say anything not because I don't have a lot because I do but if I was to say all the things that was going on in me like on my way to church this morning ambulance I'm praying homeless person 
I'm praying. Mental illness, I'm praying. Get to turn the corner and it's an accident, a really bad accident. I'm praying. It's always something that God has given us to intervene in. So when we, I don't want to become so focused on me. So when I'm so focused on me, well, I ain't doing this, I ain't doing that, you know. I, I turn TV off. I read more. I'm asking God to give me revelation knowledge of what he's doing, what he wants me to do, what is my plan, what his plan and purpose is for me in this earth, and, and how does he want me to flow in this earth? How can I be, you know, we say we love God. How can we demonstrate that to the neighborhood? You know, they, they, they see church as, oh, let's go get this. Oh, let's, no, let's go get saved. Let's go, let's go, let's show you how to walk in a place where God is your God. Let's go do that. Let, let's not go to the church with your hand out all the time. Sometimes, uh, amen, I'm just all over the place. But, um, because I could just do this and do that and I just be like, you know, and then I have to calm myself down too because with loving kindness haven't I drawn you. And it's God's love that draws. It's not my love. My love is so contaminated. Like I had a, on the way, they gave me and Trayvon the wrong food. No, they didn't, they didn't give me something. And you know, you go through drive through and, and so I can be, I can be a pastor. I'm going to say it like that. <laughs> so, um, I'm praying on the way there. God, I, I, you know, I'm sick of that spirit that I can, I'm, I'm so sick of it. So, so I said, God, I don't want to do that. So when I get there and I tell the young lady, I say, I didn't get everything I ordered. She said, well, drive around. I get to the lady that gave me my order. I said, you gave me this, but I also ordered that and I didn't get it. She looked at my receipt. She said, you're right. She gave me my food. I said, thank you very much. I drove off, I was like, God, it was my choice. I chose not, so I'm so, I'm like, wow. I chose not to be confrontational. I chose not to, and God gave me that strength to not do it, and so I was just, I was just so happy, but I, want, I, I wanted to um, read something too. For our boast is this, the testimony of our conscience that we behave in the world with simplicity and godly security, not by earth wisdom, but by the grace of God supremely toward you. For we are not writing to you anything other than as grace extended to more and more people. It may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So let our thanksgiving and what God has trusted us to do, God has trusted us right here. There's a explosion. I believe the explosion on A Mile and Shaner is gonna take place. I, I just believe that. I believe it's, it's taking place in the middle of a pandemic. I believe that our, our surfer, Man, you talk about somebody mad at a broke toe and a hand? Oh, but sometimes God will allow things to happen because you need to sit your little butt down and chill out. And that's just Joyce one-on-one. -on -one. So um, for me, my multicultural church, I love you guys. And, and I love the way the word of God comes from you. I love your humility. And um, it teaches me as well. You know, I'm not I'm not a person that is boastful because when Pastor Oz would call me and ask me, text me and say, would you read? And everything on the inside of me is screaming no. And but I, I can't, you know, because Pastor, <laughs> it's like then I I have to tell y'all this, and I'm sitting, I'm praying to them. I woke up in the middle of the night crying so hard. I just was crying. And all I saw was these two. And I was like, okay, God, what is that? 
He showed me, he's given me new parents. You know, new parents. My father was a pastor Oz, but he wasn't spiritual. My mother was a pastor Jan, but she wasn't spiritual either. So I cried and I cried because I was trying to understand that. I didn't want to be like my mother. I wanted to be like my father. But even in being like my father, he wasn't saved. He didn't know God. And so when I woke up and I was just crying and I couldn't stop crying and God showed me that you guys are my spiritual parents and I've never said that to you guys. And I'm like, wow, they are. They are my spiritual parents. And not only them, but look, I got spiritual sisters, Pastor Janine, man, Mary Jo, Teresa, man, I, I'm sorry, I can go on and on, because I love you guys, but let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in our community of believers. I thank you, Father God, that, no, Lord, it, it, we're not perfect. We will never be perfect. We love a perfect God, and we trust in you, Father God. We trust in you to bring us everything that we need. We thank you, Lord, for the miracles that we have experienced. We thank you, Lord, for the suffering, Lord, because in the suffering, we still see you. Because, Lord, you have kept us in the midst of the suffering. You have not taken us out of the suffering, but you are strengthening us in areas that we need to be strengthened in. So Lord, I want to thank you for that. And I want to say, Lord, I praise your holy name. I exalt you, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, for the things that you're going to do in this ministry. We look forward to it in Jesus name. Amen. A couple of things. Um, earlier in the week, um, I'm going to say his name anyway. Scott uh, uh, Grushin, uh texted pastor and asked them for a clarification or, or whatever, if you want to call it, on uh, uh, new wineskins. And uh, uh, the passage is in Matthew 9. And Jesus says, you know what? Nobody puts new wine in old wineskins. Because if you do that, the wineskin will burst and it'll not only ruin the wineskin, but ruin the new wine. That got me thinking. I couldn't leave that imagery. I couldn't leave that teaching uh, alone all week. And another passage in John, John 2, this is after uh, uh, Jesus changes water into wine. The reaction to the people uh, to the um, to the president of the uh, uh, of the marriage ceremony, um, he says, "You know what? Most people put good wine out first, and after they've drunk their fill and basically are drunk, then put out the inferior wine. But you have put out the best wine at last. Keep that in mind, because." I saw us, the people of God, as being wineskins. And I saw us, the people of God, as being old wineskins. We have been following the Lord for decades. And I believe even following the Lord sometimes in our personal relation our personal relationship with, with Jesus that can get stale. We can take things for granted. And uh, um, um, in that position, Jesus is not going to trust us with new revelation of who He is. There has got to be a people, a people prepared for that new revelation. Not in this church, because we have been taught better, that uh, uh, many people have said, will say, I just want to go back to normal. I want to go back to the way things are. Well, that's old wine. That's old wine. And just like uh, 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 the wedding at Cana, you know what? 
that wine doesn't satisfy us anymore. That wine doesn't taste good anymore. There, there's, there's somebody said if uh, wine is not uh, stored properly, it turns to vinegar. And I believe that all wine is vinegar right now. And the Lord is looking for new wineskins. Now, I, I am not a leathersmith. I really don't know how to make a wineskin or anything. But I'm assuming that making a wineskin or making a new leather pouch is painful. That's where pay, I think Pastor Smith gets it. At the last uh, 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 stage, there is going to be pain in our lives. And I want to say this is encouragement. If you have come to that place in your life, I have, I'm with you, Philip, and I'm with you, uh, Rob. Come to that place where I see the next step in my life, and I'm not sure I want to take it. I don't sh I'm not sure I have the guts to take it. And the Lord is saying, I believe, you're right. You don't. You're absolutely right. Because your wineskin isn't fully fashioned. My wineskin is not fully fashioned. Philip, your skin is not fully fashioned. Rob, your skin is not fully fashioned. That is not sin. That is us waiting for the Lord to fashion our wineskins. Because I believe, especially in this hour, I believe, but I have no way of, of how to identify it. There is going to be a fresh revelation of who Jesus Christ is. Not only to his people, but to the people of the world. Amen. And we are not going to be able to contain that new revelation of who he is until our wineskins are fully formed. And I look forward to it. You know, I it's almost embarrassing because when people talk about uh, uh, not going back to the, to the normal, you know, my thought is, okay, what's the new normal? I don't know. I have, I have no clue. I have no basis on which to form uh, an outlook of the new normal. I do not have an outlook of new wine. We've been go going through the Gospel of John in Bible study. And the first half of the book of John is all about the new revelation of who Mashiach, who Jesus is. People of, of Israel, teachers, Nicodemus, had, no, had, had a form uh, uh, or an idea of who Mashiach was going to be. But as, as Pastor uh, said, our concept of God is not God. So I'm looking forward to that new revelation of who Jesus is. I'm looking forward to that new revelation of the kingdom of heaven in our day and age. And that's what Jesus was trying to, to um, show people early in his ministry, is that the, the new, the kingdom of God has come upon you. They, we, didn't have a full grasp of what that meant or even what that looked like. But right here, right now, I am allowing, I'm with you, Phil. I'm with you, Rob. I am allowing the Lord to fashion that new wineskin for me. And I know it's going to be painful. I know I'm going to suffer loss. Just like Paul says, you know what? 
I have suffered the loss of many things for the, um, uh, for the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And I count them as dumb. There are certain things in my life I don't want to count as dumb. I'll admit that. There are certain things in my life I don't want to give up. I'll admit that. But right here and now, I want a new wineskin. I need a new wineskin. Philip, Rob, Pastor, Pastor Jan, Joyce, my wife, we all need a new wineskin because the things we are facing as a church are so overwhelming. The things we are facing as a church are so tragic and so high and above. We can't, you know, it's like, I'll admit this too. Where did all these sick people come from? And they're not just sick people, as was said, I have a cold, you know. These are sick people. They are people in infirm condition. Teresa, Jackie, Brock, fill in the blank. Without new revelation of who Jesus is and without a new wineskin, I can't help these people. I can't even partner with Jesus on knowing how to help these, these folks. And to me, that's overwhelming. To me, I feel impotent. But I said what I need to say. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for me. Pray for all of us. Lord Jesus, thank you that we can come before you. Lord Jesus, our Lord, Father God, thank you by the accomplishment of Jesus on the cross, shedding his blood for us, taking our place, that we can come before you and cry out to you, Lord God. Cry out to you, Lord God. Lord, what you have started in us, we believe that you will accomplish it until the day of redemption. Lord, accomplish fashioning and forming me into a new wineskin. That I may not only, it's, a, it's not a matter of just containing the new wine, it's a matter of even understanding what that is a working knowledge, a working understanding of what that is. How do we live in a new uh, era of new wine? I want to know that. I, I, I don't need to know it right now, but when it comes, I want to be able to recognize it. When it comes, I want to be able to move in it, Lord God. Lord, I want to be that instrument in your hands that I may accomplish some of what you, your will wants to accomplish, and not only in our midst, but for people on this planet, Lord God. Lord, we cry out, Lord God. Lord, Lord, I, I, right now I just cry out, Lord, I believe, heal my unbelief. And that's where I am right now. Heal my unbelief that your purpose would go forth. Not for, just for John Helby. Your purpose would go forth, not just for Lord of the Harvest, but for this area, in the, in the vineyard that we find ourselves in. Yes. Glorify your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, I should have gotten up first because after hearing everybody, my head's exploding now. And um, I, I really believe God just gave me a word, you know, based on what John just said about, you know, how do we accomplish this? And I think his word is that it's going to happen like planting a seed in the ground. In the ground, You plant your seed in the ground and you water it and overnight 
it comes up and um, you have nothing to do with it. So it's going to be like a seed bursting forth from the ground. Um, but the word that I kept getting this morning and today is, and I need my glasses, and I always forget that I have them on my head. Um, um, from John... And I can't find it. Anyways, I believe it's in the Old Testament too, but um, it was when Jesus was, uh, there was Passover, and um, people were coming to the temple and they were buying um, sacrifice, sacrifices, sacrificial animals. And um, Jesus came and he you know, he got upset. And um, the scripture that I kept thinking of was about how the zeal of the Lord was eating him. It was consuming him. It was tearing at his flesh like somebody biting into him and eating him. And um, that's what I feel like we need. This is Pentecost Sunday. We need the zeal of the Lord that strongly right now and um the the state of how things are in the world it's not just one thing it's dozens of things dozens and um you know i i believe that as far as the church goes throughout um america at least um, the philistines have thrown dirt in our wells and and clogged them up with social media, with political stances, with um, things we really shouldn't be involved in, with, make, with us trying to make ourselves the enforcers, not God's people, but the enforcers. There are people that call themselves Christians who are nothing but bullies and enforcers who go out and um, and, and intimidate others into doing what they want. That's, and they call themselves the church. And the zeal for God's house, when those things happen, it eats at me. Because you know what? That reflects on who God is. Yeah. Amen. We are not enforcers. We are not, we're not um, secular judges. We're not, we're here to tell people the good news. And um, I'm just going to pray now, and hopefully everything will come out because my head's everywhere. But, Lord, I just ask, Father, that you change us drastically, Lord God. This is Pentecost Sunday, Lord God. We already have the Holy Spirit. Maybe many of us have dulled our hearts to his voice. Have Our wells are stopped up, and so are our ears. Our eyes are covered. Lord, Give us those new wineskins that have clear ears, clear vision, a fleshy heart, Lord God, that we know your presence, Holy Spirit. Um, make us into people who um, find out what our lane is and stay in our lane, Lord God, that we... Um, that you show us what we are supposed to be doing in this hour. And we do that. And we don't look to the left and to the right. But we do what we're supposed to do. We do what you have made us to do. Let me do what only I can do. And nobody else can do it. If I don't do it, it doesn't get done. Lord, let us all have that, that, I don't know, that calling, that, um, direction from you, Lord God, that we have to do what we're made to do, and we don't look everywhere else. Um, there's just so much. Lord, we want to be fountains. We want to be fountains. We want our wells to be unstopped, and rather than even having to go down and get the water, we want the water to flow out of them, Lord God. We want you to um, 
speak strongly, Holy Spirit, when we are in the wrong territory, in the wrong lane, Lord. We don't want to be control freaks. We don't want to be bosses. We don't want to be, um, we don't want to be anything that has to do with us, Lord. We only want to be what you want us to be. It's a, it's you, Lord. We, we've said this so many times. It's all about you. But Lord, it, that's not how we act. Help me, Lord God. Help me to always hear the Holy Spirit's voice all day long, every day. If we want you to dwell with us, that's how it's got to be. It's got to be all day, every day, not just when we're here. Help us to um, let in other people around us. Let people in, Lord God. Um, help us to reach out, Lord. Those that upset us, Lord God, check our hearts right away, Lord God, and, and show us where that thing is in that person that they need you. And, and maybe it's us that needs changing. We just want things to be different, Lord God. We want... We want a new place. This is a new world, Lord God. We're only going to be here for a short time, but there's going to have to be another generation. And those people are probably like 20 years old right now that carry forth um, your, your will at the end of Scripture, Lord God, to spread the gospel, to make disciples, Lord God. And um, we want to be part of that. We want to see um, a rebirth of um, of the adoration of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. So I just ask, Lord God, that you do whatever it takes, Lord. We want to see um, the things of Scripture happen in our lifetime, Lord God. But above everything, we want you, Lord God, to be glorified. We want you to... Um, be what's left on the lips of those who encounter you. Not our names, Lord God, but your name. Not our fingerprints, but only yours, Lord. We, we just invite you, Lord God. Buildings, buildings are good because they keep out the snow and the rain, Lord God. But that's all it is. It's a building, Lord God. But even that, Lord God, has, you know, become a theater for most of the church. We're not a theater, Lord God. Church on Sunday is not theater. It's not about entertainment. It's not about chasing after the newest and latest things. It's about fellowship. It's about being with you, Lord God, experiencing your presence in the congregation, Lord God. Um, the scripture that Pastor read earlier about... Um, you know, kind of the peaceable kingdom scene. Lord, that's what we need. We need to um, include everyone, Lord God. Help us to be more inclusive, Lord God. Show us how. We don't know how to do that. We don't even know how to be to everyone. But you do because you've created all of them, all of us, Lord God. So I pray that you would um, give us bigger, wider doors that you would give us um, a new order of service, give us a new way of speaking, a new language, give us more open eyes, more dugout ears, a fleshy heart, and the zeal of your house, Lord God. We need the zeal of your house. Let this be a holy place, Lord God, this needs to be a holy place. And I'm talking about all of the churches, Lord God, not just theater. It needs to be a holy place. Help us to dig out all those wells of politics and whatever else is in tainting us and, and stopping us, Lord God. Help us to love one another in spite of everything. In spite of everything, help us to love one another. Let us be like Jesus. We just thank you and we praise you for your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we just invite you, Lord God, to give us the zeal for your house. In Jesus' name. I'd like to read uh, Matthew 5, 6. 
honesty. Uh, Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. We have to, we have to judge ourselves, not as to others or to our peers. We have to judge ourselves to Jesus. And he's the only true uh, gauge. And, uh, uh, you know, we, uh, we need to uh, know where we're at uh, with that. And I'd like to read uh, Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seats of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff, and the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. And uh, We've been hearing a lot with uh, a lot of the good words going forth about Jesus chooses us, not when we, busy, not when we deserve to be chosen <laughs> in the middle of our, our dirt, uh, you know, just the way we are. Anyone can rejoice in visits from the Lord but turning our lives over to Jesus means giving up idols, our sins, for us to choose him. And uh, I'd like to pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, none of us can do this without you. We need your grace. We need your power. God, just be with us. We want to be through you in these changes that are coming. We look forward to these changes that are coming. But we can't do it. We can't do it without you. So we anxiously await you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I kind of just got something quick to say, though. Um, uh, I've been kind of noticing how many times in our life that we get to where we're feeling really pretty close. And then how many times in our life do we get in the way? The older I get, the more I see Jesus and I feel the presence when I'm in my weakness. When I walk out the door and, you know, it's me, and I'm dependent on myself, Jesus, you just don't feel the present. I mean, look at, look at David hiding in a cave. The army sitting outside the cave. He's in his weakness. God comes to him. What's he end up? He ends up being the king, right? Job, he had everything. A family, all the livestock he wanted. He was perfectly happy, lost it all. He was in his weakness, laying on the ground. His wife comes to him and tells him, just damn God and die. And he wouldn't, even in his weakness. And what happened? God came to him. He got everything back. 
because he still chose to be with God. Moses, Pharaoh's son. We all know the story. He ends up getting put out in the desert. He's the shepherd. In his weakness, he went up on the mountain to meet God. In his weakness, he went up on the mountain to meet God. What did he get? God gave him the job of going there and saving all the slaves. I'm really starting to realize that in our weakness, and we're not getting in the way, in our humbleness, that's when God's going to be with us the most, when we're listening and not listening to our own thoughts. If all of us want to get somewhere, if the church wants to get somewhere, then we need to come to him in our weakness. It's all about him. Amen. Our strength is in him. Yeah. Keep reading through the Bible. Look at all the different people. In their weakness. Yeah. So Lord, I just pray that you let us get out of our strength. It's not our strength, Lord, it's you. Let us get into our weakness where we see you the most. Yes. All the things happening in our life, God's putting us in our weakness. All the sickness, all the COVID, we're in our weakness. Google saying that they had more people going on there looking for prayers and praying than they've ever recorded. And all the people are in their weakness. As soon as it's all gone away and we're all back into our world again, let's see if Google can still report the same thing. So Lord, I just, I pray that we stay in our weakness. We walk in your footsteps. When we come to our prayer closet, Lord, let us come in our weakness so we can hear what you really have to say. If we're reading your word, come to our house. We want to be in our weakness. Amen. We're going to close. I mean, I know we, we know it at Lord of the Harvest. But for all those people who are watching this who aren't, Lord, aren't part of Lord of the Harvest, do you see the quality of people that God has associated me with? This is incredible. Lord, just help us to press into you, Lord. Yes. You know, I'm going to have Andrea come and finish up, have her close up with whatever God gives her to close us out with prayer. And just remember, we've been in John 2 a lot. The Lord saves the best wine for last. So, Andrea, come on. Um, I've been in Nehemiah a little bit this week, and um, people have mentioned the new wine skin and new wine. And uh, one of the things I noticed that just kind of amazed me was, um, I don't know if I really realized it before, but new wine was uh, a first fruit offering in one of the offerings of the first fruits new wine was brought to the brought to the priest and i was just thinking you know if the lord gives us new wine but then we offer it back to him and you know we've talked about um just being you know like pastor philip and others have mentioned you know i'm i'm scared too i'm like nervous too i don't I don't feel ready, but I was just thinking when we are dying to ourselves, you know, it's it just feels so heavy a lot of the times. And but we die to ourselves because God will resurrect us. We die, we we put things in our lives to death be, so that we have life. And God does it. God gives us the grace 
to die. It's, it's all God, just like others have already mentioned, Jerome mentioned, and, you know, it's all about him. He accomplishes it. We just have to be willing for him to accomplish it. And it's, it's for us, but also for others. Yes. And yeah. it's unto God. It's, it's for the glory of God. So, yeah. Lord, give us grace, Lord. Thank you you do. We thank you that you give us grace. Thank you that we, we don't do anything on our own. We can't do anything on our own. And thank you, Lord, that you do it. You accomplish it and that you give us life and not life just for ourselves lord but it's life to be poured out to others and that is what that's where we want to be lord we want to yeah. we want to die to ourselves we want to pour, everything that you give us we want to pour back out to you for the benefit of others and for your glory in yes. jesus esteem amen